Okay, so you've thrown us a real curveball this time, haven't you? I mean, wow, you've given us a ton of material on chromosome structure. Yeah. And uh, it's a pretty dense topic. It is. Yeah. It is, including this PDF, uh, molecular chromosome structure dot PDF, mm -hmm. and the audio molecular chromosome structure dot M four A. Right. And our mission, if you choose to accept it, in this deep dive, is to unpack it all. Basically, we're going to extract those really fascinating insights Absolutely. and save you the time and the effort of going through it all yourself. We're going to make this whole topic, which could seem pretty complex. I mean, it's how DNA, the blueprint of life, gets organized inside ourselves. Not just understandable, but we're going to make it captivating. Yeah, I think a lot of people, when they think about packaging, they just think, oh, you just put it in a box, you know. But there's yeah. so much ingenious design, you know, hidden in this whole process. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And and what's amazing is that this fundamental code of life needs this incredibly intricate and managed system just to exist in this tiny little microscopic world of a cell. Yeah. This isn't just about keeping things tidy. This is about you know, the functions of life, right. the fine tuning of our biology and how you know, generations continue. It's really about making sure that all the information that's encoded in the DNA is accessible at the right time and in the right place exactly. so that the cell can function properly. OK, so let's dive in. Let's start with the star of the show, oh. DNA. OK. So your sources are pretty clear that DNA is basically the genetic material for pretty much all life on Earth. I mean, that includes us. Yeah, for the vast majority of organisms. Right. But then I found this really interesting. The audio brings up some exceptions. It talks about certain viruses like influenza, yeah. HIV, and even the coronaviruses we hear so much about these days. Right, right. They use RNA instead of DNA. Exactly. And I think that's a really important point. Um, while DNA is, you know, the primary player in most organisms, the fact that RNA can carry genetic information in these viruses shows how adaptable these fundamental molecules are. Right. But if we bring it back to DNA, its significance really boils down to this amazing set of capabilities it has. So it replicates with incredible accuracy. It does. It can store just massive amounts of information yeah. in that sequence of ATGC bases, right? And it can express that information by determining the order of amino acids in proteins. Oh. And then critically, it can transmit that information really reliably from generation to generation, you know, from parents to offspring. I mean, it's so easy, I think, in this day and age to just take this understanding for granted. But it's really quite a story if you trace back how we even figured out this whole inheritance thing and DNA's role. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the audio mentioned some early ideas like Aristotle. He had these ideas about some sort of essence that gets passed down. Mm, like a blueprint. And then, you know, in the 19th century, we've got Mendel and his pea plants. And he identifies these factors, mm -hmm. which we now know are genes responsible for these dominant and recessive traits. And I find it crazy that his work, which was really mathematical for the time, didn't really gain any traction. I know. Can you imagine if his work had been recognized then? It's amazing to think about how much further along we might be. Yeah, it really makes you wonder. And it wasn't until the early 1900s when scientists like Carl Korns and Hugo de Vries sort of rediscover Mendel's work. And then we have Wilhelm Johansson, who actually names the gene. Right. That's when the field of genetics really starts to take off. Yeah. But even then, we still didn't know what these genes were made of. And the early front runner was protein. We thought protein was the main carrier of the genetic code. And DNA was almost dismissed, right? Yeah. It was a simple molecule that hung out around the chromosomes. Kind of boring. The stupid molecule, they called it sometimes. And then everything changes. The PDF pinpoints this year, 1953, James Watson and Francis Crick, they're working at the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. Yeah, such an iconic place in science. I know. And with this crucial help, this nudge from these X-ray diffraction images, and these images are produced by Rosalind Franklin at King's College London. Right. And they were key to figuring out the structure. They figure out the structure of DNA. The double helix. One of the most recognizable shapes in science. The audio even hints at some drama. You know, maybe Watson got a peek at Franklin's data without her knowing. It reminds you that scientific progress isn't always this clear-cut, solitary aha. No, it. it's often messy with lots of collaboration and competition. For sure. But their model, which was built on Franklin's data, and they used these established rules of base pairing, adenine with thymine and guanine with cytosine, or A with T and G with C, and the hydro bonds of bonds that hold them together, two between A and T and three between G and C, it was a huge breakthrough. It was revolutionary. Because it immediately showed us how DNA could actually copy itself. It was like the missing piece of the puzzle suddenly clicked into place. And the design of this double helix is so simple. It's elegant. 
the PDF actually breaks down the components, the phosphate group, the deoxyribose sugar, and then the nitrogenous bases. Those are like the building blocks. Right, the fundamental units. And they link up to form the sugar phosphate backbone. Imagine this vertical support of a twisted ladder. Okay, I can picture that. And the base pairs are the rungs in between. And it's so important to remember, and both your sources highlight this, that the two strands run in opposite directions. Yes, anti-parallel. With a three prime to five prime directionality on each strand. Think of it like a two-way street where the cars are always going in opposite lanes. I like that analogy. It seems like a small detail, but it's actually super important for how DNA is read and copied by the machinery of the cell. It's absolutely crucial. That anti-parallel arrangement and that specific base pairing are what allow DNA to replicate so accurately and carry all that genetic information. So we've got this incredible molecule, this DNA, capable of all these essential functions, but the audio really highlights this next big puzzle. If you were to stretch out all the DNA in just one of your cells, it would be several feet long. Yeah, meters even. So how does something that long fit into this tiny little nucleus of a cell? Right. It's like trying to fit miles of thread into a tiny bead. That is a great way to picture it, and that's where the whole idea of chromosome structure and DNA packaging becomes so important. Absolutely. So your sources really outline this amazing feat of biological organization. They start with the simpler scenario, prokaryotic cells, things like bacteria. Figure 7.1 in the PDF shows us how their circular double-stranded DNA is just located in this region called the nucleoid. They essentially have a single chromosome. Right, they keep it simple. And in these prokaryotes, the DNA molecule gets all tangled up with these proteins. It's like a big mess of spaghetti. It is, and it folds into a series of loops, maybe 40 to 50 loops. It's a way of organizing that mess. Yeah, it's like taking a really long, tangled garden hose and you're clipping sections of it to a central ring. I like that, a central organizer ring. And then we get to this next level of compaction. It's called supercoiling. The audio describes it as atiwalita dangara, which means supercoiled domains. And these loops get twisted and folded even further. Figure 7.2 in the PDF shows this twisting. They become super compact. And all of these supercoiled regions are concentrated in that nucleoid area. It's like packing a suitcase. You keep pushing things down to get more in. Exactly. And here's the cool part. These supercoiled domains can relax independently, which the PDF points out. Right. That's important. It's super important for processes like transcription, which is when you're making RNA from the DNA template because the enzymes need to access the DNA sequence. Imagine untangling one part of that garden hose so you can work on it without messing up the rest. It's like having access to individual files in a compressed folder without having to decompress the whole thing. That's a good way to put it. The audio even mentions plasmids, those little circular DNA molecules floating around in the cytoplasm of bacteria. Oh yeah, those little guys. They undergo coiling and super coiling too, adding this whole other level of complexity. It's amazing how much is going on even in these simple cells. Okay, so now we shift gears to eukaryotic cells. These are the cells that make up our bodies. And the packaging gets even more complex. Things get a lot more elaborate. They do. Yeah. The PDF emphasizes this is all necessary because there's just way more DNA and it's all tangled up with these histone proteins. Right. Those proteins are car. And this is where the term chromatin comes in. That's the term for the complex of DNA and these histone proteins all hanging out in the nucleus. It's like the DNA's entourage. And there are two main forms of chromatin. The PDF and audio highlight this. Euchromatin which is, the audio calls it satya chromatin, meaning true chromatin. It's loosely packed and it's gene rich. And that's where the action is. That's where genes are being transcribed, meaning the information is being used to make RNA. It's like the open book of DNA, ready to be read. Exactly. And then there's heterochromatin, which is much more densely packed. It often doesn't have as many genes or the genes are silenced yeah. and it generally isn't transcribed. It's like the closed book or maybe even a book in a vault. The PDF says that euchromatin often appears more open in images, like it's less condensed. Yeah, it's more accessible. And the audio brilliantly connects all this to gene regulation, or jananyamanaya. Euchromatin is where things happen, where the cell can access genes and read the instructions. Heterochromatin keeps certain genes inactive, and it maintains the structure and stability of the chromosomes. It's like having a library with different sections that are open or closed, depending on what information you need to access. The audio even mentions epigenetics, or abhijana anavaya. Oh yeah, that's fascinating. It hints at how the state of heterochromatin can actually change, and that can influence gene expression without even changing the DNA sequence. It's like changing the font size in a document. 
You're not changing the words, but it can affect how you read and interpret the information. It's amazing that this packaging isn't just static, it's dynamic. Absolutely, it's constantly changing in response to the needs of the cell. So the PDS takes us through these four distinct levels of eukaryotic DNA packaging. It's a hierarchical system of condensation. The first level is forming nucleosomes. This is where the double helix wraps around a core of eight histone protein molecules. The audio describes this as histone anunu ataka vata velanava, which basically means DNA wrapping around eight histones. Yeah, so about 146 base pairs of DNA wind around each of these histone octamers mm -hmm. and it creates a structure that looks like beads on a string. And the strings is stretches of linker DNA, Sambandaka DNA. And this initial wrapping makes the DNA a lot shorter, creating a fiber about 10 nanometers in diameter. It's like taking a really long thread and winding it around a spool. Okay, so you've got this long, thin strand of DNA. You wind it around these protein spools, and that's your first level of organization. It's more compact. And then the second level, as the PDF explains in figure 7.4 illustrates, these nucleosomes coil even further. Now we have this chromatin fiber that's about 30 nanometers in diameter. So it's like taking that beaded string and twisting it into a thicker rope. And then at the third level, this 30 nanometer fiber forms these bigger structures called loop domains. They're about 300 nanometers long, and they're attached to a protein scaffold called protein adharakaya. Figure 7.5 in the PDF shows these radial loop domains coming out from the central framework. It's like organizing that thicker rope into a series of large loops and anchoring them to a frame to keep them all neat and tidy. And finally, we reach the fourth level, the chromosome, how we usually think of it, especially during cell division. The fully packaged deal. The PDF explains that all this coiling and folding creates these really compact chromosomes, Varna de Ha. And we can actually see them under a microscope during cell division. Right, they become visible during metaphase, which is a stage of cell division. These metaphase chromosomes are big, about 1400 nanometers in diameter. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that each chromosome has two sister chromatids, Varna de Hasha, and each of those contains a single DNA molecule. So even a single chromatid is still about 700 nanometers in diameter. That's amazing when you think about how much DNA is packed into that tiny space. It's an incredible amount of compaction. Just to recap the scale, we start with the 2 nanometer DNA helix and the 10 nanometer nucleosome, then the 30 nanometer fiber, then the 300 nanometer loops domains, then the 700 nanometer chromatid, and finally the 1400 nanometer chromosome. It's mind boggling how much the DNA gets condensed. This whole packaging system has to be so incredibly organized and efficient. It's absolutely essential for the cell to function properly. You've taken us, dear listener, on a wild ride, starting from the basic structure of DNA and ending with this amazingly intricate packaging within chromosomes. And it's so clear that this isn't just about fitting a lot of DNA into a small space. It affects how our genes are controlled and how our genetic information is passed down through generations. It's about life itself. So as we wrap up this deep dive, here's a final question for you to think about. Considering how complex this DNA packaging is and how dynamic chromatin is, what other amazing roles might these structures play that we're only beginning to discover? Could the way our DNA is organized have unforeseen effects on other processes in the cell or even on our development and health? Maybe this will spark some new questions for you leading to further exploration. And who knows, maybe in our next deep dive, we'll explore some of those very questions based on what you're most curious about. I can't wait to see what we uncover next. Me too, me too.